like to welcome each of you who's here in person as well as those of you who are joining us live this morning. And I want to thank you all for your prayers this past week. We praise God for a wonderful week at junior camp. Uh, we had eight campers who went uh, this week, and uh, we praise the Lord for several decisions that were made, including one of the young people who trusted Christ as Savior this week. And uh, certainly a wonderful week, and they're already fired up to go again next, next year. Um, I am grateful that Becca and I and our boys were able to go each day and be able to be a part of it. We treasured the time we got to spend with the boys and girls who were there. And we also benefited from the ministry there of, of the Edge Christian Camp. Um, I'm very grateful for that ministry. Um, this, the speaker this week um, was phenomenal, and everything that they did there at the camp was top-notch. And so I'd encourage you, if you haven't been there, um, if you're not very familiar with the camp ministry, I'd encourage you to, to make plans to go there sometime. I, Probably won't be super soon at this point, but uh, I'd encourage you that way. And I'm excited about how we can continue as a church family to benefit from the ministry of that camp. Uh, it is no secret that the original plan for junior camp was, was altered. Originally, we were going to go June 29th through July 3rd for an overnight camp. And instead, we ended up going this past week for day camp. But, you know, despite the changes... God's grace and, and your prayers were very evident. In one specific way, on our way to camp on Monday morning, uh, it started raining. And I don't think that you need to have had much experience with summer camp to know that rain can put a serious damper on the activities. And uh, so I'm not going to lie, I was a little bit nervous on our way there on Monday morning. But every day, Monday through Friday, um, we had dry weather the whole time we were there. Uh, the rain stopped before we got there Monday morning. And then, just as if to remind us that he holds it all in his hands, as we were loading onto the van to head back on Friday, uh, things started, the wind started blowing, the clouds started coming together for a storm. Uh, it was just a reminder to me that it was all in God's control. Uh, there's a lot that's outside of our control. And it, we've been reminded about that often these days. We've been reminded about how unsure we are about what the future holds. Uh, for me, it's given a new meaning to the words, Lord willing. Uh, Lord willing, we'll go to summer camp. Lord willing, we'll meet together again this evening. Lord willing, I'll see you again soon. We're all coming to see that things can change very quickly. Uh, we make plans, but they're all subject to change. You know, I think about the early church. When they said, if the Lord wills, they knew that arrest or execution might await them. Uh, they knew that they might lose their jobs, their homes, or their loved ones to persecution. There was a lot of uncertainty for them in those days, but there was comfort in those words. If the Lord wills, or Lord willing. They could rest in the fact that whatever happened, it was certainly part of God's plan. Whether their plans were accomplished or not, they could rejoice because God's plans are never thwarted. And we can rejoice in that same truth this morning. God's plans are never thwarted. My plans have changed a lot over the past couple of weeks, over the past months. But God's plan hasn't. Our uncertainty does not change the fact that our Lord will always have the victory. Let's praise him for that this morning. Pastor Ned. Let's stand and sing victory in Jesus. All three stanzas.
quick, please. Phil Withers is going to come and lead us in prayer this morning. Let's pray. Father, how wonderful it is to know that we have victory in Jesus. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to purchase it. It's already been purchased for us. Because Christ on the cross said, it is finished. And so we, we rejoice this morning, Father, in what you have done for us, in loving us, sealing us unto the day of redemption, and Lord, giving us every good and perfect gift because of that love that you have in Christ for us. Thank you for indwelling us with your precious Holy Spirit who convicts us, comforts us, and always points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we gather this morning to bring you praise and honor and glory because, Father, that is what is due your name. And Father, we thank you for the perfect gift of your word this morning. We ask that you would give Pastor Brown an unction from the Holy Spirit to preach without fear, favor, or compromise so that we can hear what thus saith the Lord. We ask your Holy Spirit to do a work in us this morning that would convict us to help us lay aside every sin that doth so easily beset us. And Lord, we'll just give you the praise and honor and glory as we worship you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. political unrest, or whether it's attacks on Christian things, as a pastor was attacked this week up in Chantilly during a Bible study, still we know that Jesus Christ has the victory, and that if he's with us and for us, nothing can take us away from his love. And he's also promised us that we can mount up on eagle's wings. Let's stand together as we sing that song together, Eagle's Wings.
say our verse of the month, we'll say first the reference, and then the verse, and then the reference again. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. Thank you. You may be seated. Do you want to take a moment to welcome any guests who are joining us this morning? It's good to have some guests back who've been with us before, as well as anyone who's visiting with us uh, by live stream. I uh, want to make sure I don't believe there are any first-time guests here this morning, but I don't want to overlook anyone. Anyone, is this your first time here this morning? All right. I'm not going to make you stand up and introduce yourself or anything, but uh, all right. Well, it's good to see each of you. If you are joining us, uh, by live stream and perhaps this is the first time that you've joined us this way or maybe it's not but uh, you are you haven't been here in person we haven't had the chance to meet you we love the chance to hear from you uh, just to know that this has been able to be a blessing to you as well as if there's something that we can help you with spiritually a way that we can be an encouragement to you we'd love to hear from you about uh, how we can help that way as well I uh, do want to have uh, a prayer in just a moment. did want to mention a couple of prayer requests for each of you. Um, many of you already know that Bill and Diane White are both in the hospital right now. Um, Diane fell a couple of times, and um, they're, they're trying to figure out exactly what's caused that. I've heard several possibilities about what caused that, but be in prayer for her, um, but especially be in prayer for Bill. He, uh, he was brought to the, to the ER, and um, he, he coded while he was there. He became unresponsive. And he's in ICU right now on a ventilator. And so, um, again, they're running tests to try to figure out exactly what's going on there. Uh, but please, please keep Bill and Diane in, in, in prayer right now and uh, pray the Lord will work and, and bring healing there. Um, also, I found out this morning, let's pray for Linda Lennon. Um, she's uh, been coming as she can, but she's having some serious problems with her knees, quite a bit of pain. She can't really move around at all. And so, um, let's be in prayer for her as well. I know there are a number of other prayer requests, a number of other folks we want to be praying for, and I encourage you in your heart as we pray to mention those folks as well um, along with me as we pray to the Lord. Let's bow together for prayer. Father, thank you that we can come to you who knows all and who cares about every situation, but Lord, also you have the power to do whatever is best in every situation, and we're so grateful for that. Again, when these things are outside of our control, uh, it's, it's hard many times. We wish that we could step in and, and bring healing to those who are sick. But Father, we know that your plan is always best. And we're grateful that we can have an impact by coming to you in prayer and uh, pleading with you for our brothers and sisters. We do pray for Bill and Diane White today, be especially with Bill. And uh, I pray that you would help him as they try to to figure out what's going on and treat uh, whatever is causing the problems he's facing. I pray that you would give grace to he and Diane and their family, um, that you'd bring healing to her as well. Again, that you would uh, make it clear to the doctors uh, what is going on physically and what needs to be done to help. Father, we pray for your peace, um, for your help, and for your healing. Uh, Lord, we pray for Linda Lennon this morning as well. I know she wants to be here, and uh, she just can't physically, and I know that's true for others as well. Um, and Lord, we pray for your grace for them. I pray for those who have been affected by the virus, um, either have been exposed to it or, or have it at this time. I pray that you would give grace in each of those situations. You'd bring healing um, and uh, help them through this time. I pray that uh, for each of them it would be something that they could weather without a great deal of of trouble. And uh, Lord, I just pray for your grace there. I do pray that you would uh, keep the virus from spreading among our church family, uh, that you would keep those who are here this morning and others uh, safe from the virus. Again, we know your plan is best, but Lord, we, we certainly desire that you would keep us healthy and strong and able to continue to meet together. I pray that you would please be with our missionaries. Uh, Father, I thank you for the way that uh, them facing the same issues and challenges as us has brought us together. Um, but Lord, you know that uh, they face a great deal of challenge as well at this time. They want to reach out with your word. They want to 
reach folks with the gospel, but in many ways they're limited about what they can do. And I pray that you would continue to help them to be uh, creative and wise and just to follow your leading in that. We pray for our fellow uh, churches here in this area and across, uh, across the world, um, again, who are trying to minister in a way that is pleasing to you, continuing to try to reach souls with the gospel. I pray that you would give wisdom, that you would give health, that you would guide each of those who's in leadership. Lord, we pray for our pastor. I ask that you would protect him as he's away uh, over this weekend. Uh, bless that time together with family for him. Uh, bless him as he preaches this, uh, today. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would continue to grant him wisdom as he tries to lead um, and point us all to you. Lord, we ask that you would uh, do a work in our church family. Lord, help us to set aside the things that are unimportant. Uh, help us to focus on you. Help us to focus on the reason you've left us here. Please use us, as we just talked about in that verse, to be lights for you, to shine before men, that our lives would show forth Christ, and that our words would point others to him. And we ask that you would do a great work through us to reach our community with the gospel. Bless us through the rest of this service today, we ask. Uh, guide us as we seek to look to you, to praise you, and to draw closer to you. Lord, you said that if we pray for wisdom, you'll grant it. You said that if we draw nigh to you, you'll draw nigh to us. And we want to we claim both of those promises this morning. We love you when we pray this all in Jesus' precious name.
the love of God, how rich and pure. And those of us that have experienced his love know that it reaches to the deepest hell because most of us have been brought from the depths and Christ found us and brought us back. We're going to stand and sing under his wings. What a great place to be able to stay and to be sheltered. Under his wing. Let's stand together and sing. Trust the one who walks on water 
life seems overwhelming when your nights seem hard and long when the burden seems unending and the enemy a throng through the word the savior saying firmly calling tenderly peace be still not to the storm but peace be still now to you trust the one who's walking on the water trust the one who's leading through the storm when you cannot see the shore line when there is no goal in sight when you focus on the certainty that all will be alright trust in him who made the tempest trust in him who tossed and torn trust the one who in your storm hasten now a weary pilgrim don't you fear and don't you doubt would you trust your gracious savior though your life seems tossed about oh remain within the tempest seeing jesus in the way may trial to you be precious as you trust him and obey. Trust the one who's walking on the water. Trust the one who's leading through the storm. When you cannot see the shoreline, when there is no Focus on the certainty that I will be alright. Trust in Him who made the tempest. Trust in Him who tossed and torn. Trust the one who walks on water. grateful for a faith that doesn't pretend bad things don't happen. A lot of people don't know what to do in life. They just have to focus on the happy things and pretend that bad things aren't there. But in Christ, we can face trouble head on because we can trust in the one who's in control of it all. Thank you for that reminder and song this morning. I hope you all don't mind being guinea pigs, because the message I'm going to share this morning will be unusual. Um, I've never heard a message quite like it before, uh, but I trust the unusual format will be a help and not a hindrance to the Lord's work this morning. But let's pray, and then we'll get into it. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the richness of it. Thank you that we can never mine its depths. Thank you that there is so much there. Thank you for all those in Scripture that we can learn so much from. And as we seek to learn from one of those individuals this morning, I pray that you would draw us closer to you. Help this to be about Christ, focusing on Christ. Help us all to be challenged and encouraged and drawn closer to you as a result of our time this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. I'm going to be sharing a testimony with you today, but it will not be mine. It will be the testimony of an individual in Scripture to help us really enter into this individual's life and testimony today. I'll be sharing it from his perspective. So I will, in a sense, become this character. 
while some imagination is involved in that, uh, every possible detail has come from the words of Scripture. Uh, I'm not going to be reading any Scripture passages aloud to you this morning. I'll be quoting from some, and uh, there's going to be some Scripture passages on the screen for you uh, that are the basis for what I'm going to be sharing today. Specifically, I'd encourage you. I'd encourage you to take the time to read all the passages. Go ahead and jot them down once they're up there. Um, but especially read Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26. In fact, if you'd like, you can turn to Acts 9 this morning, and more or less you'll be able to follow along uh, with the words of Scripture as I share this testimony today. I am Saul. I want to tell you about who I am. To tell you that, however, I must first tell you who I used to be. I was born in Tarsus. I was a child of privilege, being a Roman citizen, and a child of pride, being a Jew. Born into the tribe of Benjamin, I was given a strong Jewish name, Saul, the name of Israel's first king. My parents, of course, didn't want me to follow his example in every respect. His foolish pride, thinking he knew better than God. Strange how much I'd come to be like him in that very way. I was given the best of Jewish educations, a Dr. Gamaliel, a renowned rabbi, thoroughly versed in the law and writings, taught me, and, and I soaked it up. My aspiration? To be a Pharisee, and a strict keeper of the law. I didn't just want to be any Pharisee, I wanted to be the strictest of the Pharisees. I didn't just want to keep the law, I wanted to keep the law and the writings better than any man before or after me. I wanted to be the best Jew who ever lived. In a way, I reached that goal. I studied the writings of the scribes and doctors. I soaked up all that Gamaliel could give me, and I went looking for more. I memorized most of the Torah. I was well on my way to becoming the foremost Pharisee and the most respected member of the Sanhedrin. I had set myself high goals and showed every sign of reaching them all. But I wanted more. I had knowledge. I had a strictly disciplined life, but I craved a chance to show my religious zeal, uh, to show how passionate I really was about God's commands. And I found my opportunity. One day, a man named Stephen was dragged before the Sanhedrin. The council accused him of being a ringleader among those who called themselves followers of the way. They are disciples of Jesus, a carpenter's son from the little town of Nazareth. Well, when this Jesus was executed, most people expected his band of followers to scatter. And for a short time, it seemed the world had heard the last of the followers of the way. Then they reemerged. At Pentecost, when Jews, myself included, had gathered to celebrate the feast in Jerusalem, they suddenly reappeared in far greater numbers than before. Before we Jews knew what was happening, there were thousands of them, and they were telling people everywhere to repent and believe on Jesus. They said that Jesus had died for a purpose. They said that Jesus had risen from the dead. They said he was God, and he had come to save us from sin. They said God was pleased not by careful attendance to the law, which was my life, but only by Jesus. They called everyone, and I mean everyone, to put faith in Jesus and experience God's favor and eternal life. Their message angered me deeply. If careful study and attendance to the law of God was not the way to appease him, then why all the laws? They had simplified the matter to a point that sickened me, and in my mind, they had blasphemed the name of God by suggesting not only that God had a son, but that that son was equally God. I had a direction for my zeal. The Sanhedrin saw to it that Stephen was stoned, and I watched as that sentence was carried out. I wanted to stone them all. I hated the followers of the way. I hated the name of Jesus. I hated this simple faith that they preached. I wanted it all eradicated. 
I wanted them all wiped off the face of the earth. Even under the Romans, we Jews still had some authority. With the high priest's blessing, I began to hunt them. No gathering in Jerusalem was safe. I couldn't personally execute them, but I could have them imprisoned. I, could find, I would find out which house they were meeting in, and I would raid it, seizing men and women, imprisoning them because they dared call themselves followers of the way. They dared declare allegiance to Jesus. My anger was unbounded. As I dragged them away, I would hurl every insult I could imagine against Jesus, calling him everything from an illegitimate child to a disillusioned fool. I swelled with pride any time I could force them to deny Jesus or to dishonor his name. Every chance I got, I served as a witness against them as they stood trial for their seditious beliefs. Even I was surprised by my hatred for this man I steadfastly maintained was dead. As my number of arrests climbed, so did my hatred. Soon Jerusalem was not enough. The followers of the way had started to scatter, and I wanted to continue to track them down. I got letters authorizing me to go to Damascus to hunt them there. I put together a team. Men I knew were likewise enthusiastic about taking down these troublemakers. And we made the trip, and we'd almost reached the city when my life changed forever. I met him. I met Jesus. Do you know the feeling when you step out into sunlight from a dark room? It's blinding. It can leave you disoriented, even off balance. Well, on the way to Damascus, it was the middle of the day, but suddenly it was like somebody pulled back a curtain, and daylight brighter than daylight streamed down on us. I shielded my eyes, but the shock knocked me to the ground, and suddenly a voice spoke, and it filled me like I was hearing with more than just my ears. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? I had persecuted a lot of people, so I asked who was speaking. Though even as I did, I knew that somehow I knew exactly who it was. I could see his face. It was beautiful, not because it was attractive, but because it was full of truth and kindness. I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, came the answer. Only someone who has lived a life of anger understands the piercing truth of his next words. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. It is hard. My anger had consumed me and left me miserable, never satisfied, only burning inside. I was ready to be done. Ever since I had watched Stephen die a terrible death, doubts had nagged at me. How could someone die so violently and yet so peacefully? Calling, even as he died, that God would forgive his accusers, that God would forgive me. The scene often played before me as other followers of Jesus peacefully and joyfully responded with kindness to my bitter anger. Even as I hauled them away, many prayed for me. Many tried to tell me that if I only believed in Jesus, I too would receive the Holy Ghost. Even as I spewed venomous insults in response, doubts nagged at my mind. Now as I lay on my face in the presence of the Jesus I had so often blasphemed, I surrendered. I trembled as I said the words. Lord, I said, what wilt thou have me to do? I was done trusting in my religious works. After all, look where my piety had led me. Even in the pursuit of my own righteousness, I had degenerated into one of the most angry, most hateful men in all of Jerusalem. I needed a helper. No, I needed a savior. Jesus. I needed Jesus. That was it. The simple faith to give up on myself and run to Jesus. It seemed too simple. But in that moment, I knew my life had changed forever. 
my life was over. The life that would rise from the dust was a different life. Saul, the strict Pharisee, the angry persecutor, was dead. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Arise, Jesus said to me, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. I spoke no word of protest. My life was no longer mine. Whatever he said my future should be, I would obey. My poor companions were bewildered. They saw the light, but they did not see his face like I did. They heard a sound, like thunder, one of them said, but they couldn't make out any of the words. They could only hear my feeble replies. I rose weakly, and as I did, I realized I could see nothing. I blinked several times, but nothing happened. They had to help me into the city. We who had planned to enter so majestically entered led by a dusty, sightless man being slowly guided along by foot. Accommodations were arranged, and I entered and did what Jesus had told me to do. I awaited further orders. I ate and drank nothing. Those days were filled with a mixture of joy and anxiety. Moments came when I wondered whether I was really doing the right thing. But the clear words returned to me, It shall be told thee what thou must do. I had my instructions. I simply needed to trust and follow. I wondered what the future held. My life, my purpose, the respect I had commanded, they were all gone. Would I be alone forever? Was I condemned to be the enemy of both Christians and Jews? Well, after three days of waiting, a man entered my room one day. Ananias was his name. I could tell by his heavy footsteps that he was a man, but I could tell by the way his feet dragged that he entered the room with fear. Still, before I could speak a word of greeting, he spoke. His voice was low but steady. Brother Saul. The words were sweeter than cold water to my thirsty tongue. He had called me Saul, his brother. We were fellow followers. He told me Jesus had sent him. And then God's power poured through him and my eyes were opened. I saw his kind face, the first face I had seen since gazing on the face of Jesus. And I couldn't help rejoicing in the fact that a trace of the same truth and kindness lived in the face of this man. My brother. Brother Saul. Ananias told me that God had chosen me to speak of him to the Jews, but also to Gentiles and to kings. He told me I would suffer greatly for the sake of Jesus' name, but none of those things weakened my resolve. I would follow wherever Jesus led. I lost no time in being baptized, declaring myself a disciple of Jesus. I still rejoice at how readily the believers in Damascus received me into their fellowship. I did run into trouble later in Jerusalem. The disciples there had a hard time accepting that the hardened hater of Jesus could have become his disciple. My faith needed to grow, but God had to grow their faith too. Brother Barnabas helped with that. When they were afraid of me, Barnabas vouched for me. I guess you could say he vouched for God. He reminded them that God really was great enough to save a wretched man like me. Jesus' blood really is enough. The believers at Damascus, though, were different. They received me. Beginning with Ananias, they called me brother. I joined their fellowship, and soon I began to preach to the Jews, my countrymen, I wanted them, too, to know the foolishness of trying to establish our own righteousness. Only Jesus, I told them, only Jesus kept every scrap of the law. Only he could live up to God's perfect standard. Only he can offer a means of satisfying God. My zeal had a new outlet. It was no longer angry zeal. It was a zeal of love. I wanted them to know. I wanted them to believe. I wanted my Jewish brothers to become my believing brothers, fellow followers of the way. I 
first they were amazed. They, they thought there must be a mistake. It shocked me the first time I experienced the same venomous hatred I had hurled at Jesus' disciples. I found that the one who had hated was now hated. I had been the foremost enemy of Jesus, and now the enemies of Jesus wanted nothing more than to take me down. By God's grace, I grew. I I learned much. And as I lived each day to follow the orders of my master, he helped me become a well-known speaker there in Damascus. Ananias' words began to come true. There were Jews who listened, but Gentiles began to ask to hear as well. Speak of God to the Gentiles? At first, it struck me as impossible. Jehovah is the God of the Jews, right? Then I remembered a phrase from the scriptures. Jehovah is the Lord of all the earth. I thought of the words of God to Ananias. He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. It began to dawn on me that Jesus came not just to save the Jews, but all people, every group, everyone. Jesus died for the world. Father, forgive them, Jesus had prayed from the cross for Romans. I began to understand that I, the proud Jew, the Pharisee among Pharisees, was going to proclaim the wonderful news of Jesus to the Gentiles. Dogs, many Jews called them. I seemed the wrong man for the job. My background had prepared me, if anything, for preaching to my fellow Jews. But I learned to rejoice in God's way, even when it makes no sense. Perhaps that's the reason some Jewish Jerusalem believers struggled to believe God wanted me as a messenger. I just seemed so ill-fitted to the job. I'm not an attractive man. My short stature and homely looks command little respect. I struggle when speaking before a group. Despite my education, though I have no trouble writing, when I try to speak to a crowd, my words flow no better than those of a common, unlearned man on the street. Many of my listeners have written me off as ignorant. And beside all that, I have my sickness, my thorn call it. It prods and pokes me everywhere I go. For some, it distracts from my preaching. For others, it makes them ashamed to be with me. I often wonder why God would allow it to remain. It seems such a hindrance. It seems to hurt rather than help my work for God. Still, I'm learning that the way of God is best. Even in this, I'm learning to rejoice in God's way, even when it makes no sense. I'm learning to be a follower of the way. The words of Ananias are coming true in another respect. He told me that the Lord said I would suffer great things for his name's sake. I thought perhaps he meant the ridicule that I would face for turning to Jesus. I thought he might mean the humbling nature of speaking before crowds again and again with my weaknesses. I soon came to understand he meant more. The hatred of my fellow Jews became rage. They knew they had no grounds to have me executed, but they wanted more than just imprisonment for me. They wanted me dead. They hatched a plan to murder me and posted guards at each of the city gates so I could not escape from Damascus. The name of the Lord be praised that I found out about the plan. At first, I did not believe that such a thing could be true. Then I remembered my Lord's words through Ananias. Perhaps the great suffering was only beginning. The believers at Damascus banded together to help me, to help Brother Saul. They got a large basket and used ropes to lower me over the wall, and I fled to Jerusalem. It did not take too long before I had an attempt on my life there as well. This time, it was the Greeks who tried to kill me. Somehow, I feel that the suffering and danger are far from over. Along the way, Barnabas has continued to help my faith. At one point, 
I ended up back in my hometown of Tarsus for a time, unsure where to go next. I wanted to take a step forward, but I was unsure which way to go. Barnabas helped me in my indecision. He came for me and told me he wanted my help in Antioch. I've been his companion ever since. He has helped my faith immensely. He's helped me continue to walk, always pointing me to Jesus. We're in Antioch now. This is a wonderful assembly. We're surrounded by believers, some of them Jews, some of them Gentiles, from so many different backgrounds and cultures, and yet we're unified with the closest bond that I've ever known. A new term has begun to be used. I do not know if it'll catch on, but I hope it does. They're calling us Christians. We are followers of Christ, the Anointed One, Jesus the Messiah. We are followers of the way, but Jesus is the way. We're followers of Christ. We are Christians. Barnabas and I are preparing for a trip. It will be unlike any trip I have known. We're sailing to Cyprus, the place of Barnabas' birth, to tell them there about Jesus. We do not know where else we'll travel, but we leave with great anticipation. We follow Jesus to Cyprus and look forward to where else he'll lead us and what he will do to change the lives of those, both Jews and Gentiles, who cross our path. We walk in simple faith. We are followers of our, saviors, of our Savior, followers of the way, and there's no other way I would rather walk. There's much that we can learn from the testimony of Saul, soon to be called Paul, the apostle. I trust you've been challenged by how God worked in his salvation and early ministry. Have you met Jesus? No, you will not likely be struck to the ground by blinding light. But it was not the experience that changed Saul's life. It was meeting Jesus that changed Saul's life. He recognized that his works could not save him. That he, just like everyone else around him, needed a savior. He surrendered. Have you surrendered? If you've not, please do so today. And if you have questions or you need some help about what the Bible says about that, please speak with me or speak with one of the other followers of Jesus who's here this morning. And we would love nothing more than to introduce you to him and show you how you, too, can know him as Savior. Another challenge to consider as we think about the life of Saul. Are you more like the believers at Damascus or the believers at Jerusalem? Are you ready to receive and encourage even the most unlikely followers of Jesus? In a broader sense, Are you willing to accept that God's way of doing things will often look different from your way? Are you personally ready to follow Jesus by faith, despite your limitations, the reasons you seem unqualified, or the discouragement and outright opposition you face? Saul did not seem well qualified for what God said he wanted him to do. But he obeyed anyway. You'll notice on the screen that not everything comes from the book of Acts. There in 2 Corinthians, Galatians, and other places, Paul talks about his weakness. He talks about the things that made him the wrong man for the job. The challenges that he had. That thorn in the flesh that he asked God to take away. If he had looked at that he would have decided that God didn't want or need him. Instead, he followed the call of God anyway. Perhaps you're in that position today. You've made the excuse for too long that you cannot step forward because you're not good enough. You aren't. Move forward for God anyway, because he is enough. We don't think of Saul as the weak, sick man that he was because of the amazing way that God used him. 
What does that reflect on? Does that reflect on the fact that Saul just had hidden potential? He just really had it in him all the time, and he just had to let it come out? No, it reflects on the power of God. God used Saul not because Saul was the right man for the job. God used Saul even though Saul was the wrong man for the job. And God wants to do the same in our lives. In fact, if you think you're the right man for the job, then you probably need to go back to the Lord and let him help you with that pride. You aren't enough. You aren't good enough to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. But God wants you anyway. And his power is enough. Perhaps today you know of a fellow believer who needs to be helped. Who needs someone to come to them and take some steps of faith alongside them. Saul had Barnabas. And before that he had Ananias. How far would Saul have gone if Ananias had not obeyed God? How far would Saul have gone if Barnabas hadn't trusted in the power of God in Saul's life? If not for those men, where would Saul have ended up? Now, of course, we can say God's power is greater than all that. God can accomplish his plan despite all of that, but from a human perspective, those men were incredibly important and instrumental in Saul's life. How many other Sauls are out there today waiting for a Barnabas to come to them and say, let's serve God together. Come with me to Antioch, Saul. Let's serve God together in that church. Which of the two ended up being better known? Saul, by far. He ended up going further than Barnabas ever went. But it was Barnabas' investment in his life that laid the foundation for that. And I want to challenge you today, whether you think you're in the right position to be a Barnabas or not, whether you think that you're the, the mature, the perfect person for the job who just has all the experience in walking with the Lord, or whether you say, you know, I'm, I'm struggling along this way too. But why don't I go to my brother and say, let's follow Christ together. Let's serve God together. We can learn much about the life of faith from Paul. And we didn't even get to the beginning of his first missionary journey. We can learn about how faith begins by meeting Jesus. How faith looks at obstacles has nothing to God. How believers can encourage each other's faith. And how faith follows Jesus even when the path ahead seems unclear. Let's bow together for prayer. Father, I thank you for the testimony of Saul. Lord, we look at him as a giant of the faith. We look at him as the goal that we could never achieve. Father, we forget how weak he was in his own flesh. We forget how much he owed directly to your power in his life. He didn't succeed, he didn't make an influence because of his own strength, but because he knew how to depend on your strength. Father, I do pray this morning that if there's somebody here who does not know Christ as Savior, who has never truly met Jesus, who has never truly said, I'm leaving all of me behind and I'm trusting only in Jesus. To help them see their sin and their need for you today. Help them to take that step of faith and trust in you and begin that wonderful life of walking by faith. And Father, I pray for those of us who are Christians, who are followers of Christ. Help us to follow by faith. Lord, if there are obstacles or challenges or limitations that are stopping us from doing what you want to do in our lives. 
would you help us to move ahead with your power today? If there's somebody else in our life who needs an encouragement, who needs somebody to come alongside and encourage and help their faith, would you help us to do that? Lord, help us not so much to be like Saul, but to be like Jesus. We love you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a hymn. The instruments will play. Um, we're not necessarily going to have a come forward invitation. If you'd like to come up here and pray, you're welcome to do that. You're welcome to pray there at your seat about what the Lord has worked in your heart about. And again, I'd encourage you, if you need Christ as Savior, if you have questions about that, please see us. Um, I would love to talk to you about that, take as much time as is necessary to speak to you about Christ. So please catch me and speak with me after the service. If you need to surrender something to the Lord, do that today. If you'd like to talk to somebody, counsel with somebody, um, spend some time uh, seeking the Lord together, trying to have the Lord's direction, again, please reach out. Uh, myself and the pastoral staff, we Again, we'd love to take the time to counsel with you and try to point you to the Lord. Um, Saul is just one example of what God can do with one life. And God can accomplish just as great things through any life of someone here today. But it's about being willing to walk by faith. Let's ask for God's grace to do that today. If you would stand as the instruments play and take care of business with the Lord. shares in the book of 2 Corinthians, that's why God let that thorn in the flesh remain. Uh, He said, lest I be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. So that Paul, every day of his life, would have to say, I need thee. Lord, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Who is sufficient for these things? Not me, but Jesus is. Well, we're going to have some announcements to close the service this morning. Pastor Coles is going to come and share something with you, and then I'll come and share a few more reminders. Well, thank you, Pastor Brown, for that powerful, powerful adaptation of the life of Paul and the application to us. What a what a great message. I appreciate that. I want to talk to you for just a couple moments about our live stream ministry. I thank God for, I, I, I thank God that Pastor Asher asked me to have a part in this. In fact, he kind of put me in charge of it. <clears throat> and uh, the truth is that I have an aptitude for this sort of thing, and, and I love doing it. In fact, if God hadn't called me to preach, I probably would have been involved in some aspect of this in my life, in my life's work. I like it that much. I love it that much. But I'd like, I need some other people that love it just as much. Um, we're in need of some camera operators. 
Um, <clears throat> We have, I have one camera operator that's on vacation all this month. Another one texted me last night and said he wasn't able to be here today, and we understand that. And uh, I would like to get enough camera operators that I can rotate you, and uh, you wouldn't have to do it all the time, but we'll rotate it. But, I, but before you respond to this, I want you to pray about it. This is a ministry. Our live stream ministry is a ministry, and we consider it a ministry, and we put our heart and soul into it because it is a ministry. Uh, there's, operating a camera is not just standing or sitting behind the camera and looking at it. It's a ministry. It gives a, it gives a person with an aptitude and opportunity to use, uh, use some imagination and, and to uh, look for shots and so forth. That's all that's important. I plan to give some uh, some training to our well to the whole live stream crew. We're building a crew, and uh, if you are if you feel like you might have an aptitude in running a camera, operating a camera, whether you're man or woman, teenager, and you would like to get involved in this ministry, come see me about it. Uh, we need you, and uh, I thank God for Dietrich. She's uh, taken over the sound aspect of it up there. She's doing an excellent job. We have all professional equipment. Uh, some of it's kind of low-end professional equipment, but it's professional equipment. And we're, do, we're trying to do a professional job. We're trying to do it like you're watching, if you're watching at home, that it's a television program. We want to do it that way because we believe that it'll, it'll generate more interest and, um, and um, entice more people to watch. We, we'd like to get a, a, a large a watching capacity or, or people watching. We have people in other countries that are watching and other people that don't come to Good News Baptist Church that are watching the live stream. And we've heard, uh, we've heard from several and have gotten some wonderful comments from people that have watched our live stream uh, presentation. But it's an excellent opportunity to get the gospel out. Uh, there'll be some people that'll sit, sit at home that won't go to church. Uh, we'd like for them to go to church. And we'd like to entice them, if they're in this area, to come to Good News Baptist Church. So if you feel like you might have an aptitude for this sort of thing, come talk to me about it. And I'd like to get you involved in our live stream ministry. Okay? Um, uh, we're getting some new equipment. The church voted Wednesday night to buy a new switcher which will improve the quality of our live stream. And uh, it'll take, take some time for training on that new switcher and so forth. But we'd like to get you involved. If you're interested in that, please come see me. But consider it a ministry. It's not a way to get out of a service because you're not, you're not getting out of the service. And as a matter of fact, it'll get you more involved in the service because you have to concentrate on what's going on. That's why I said you don't stand or sit behind the camera. You have to know what's going on on the platform and listen and hear and, uh, and respond uh, ac uh, in, uh, in response to that. So let me know if you're interested. Thank you, Pastor. I'm very grateful for Pastor Coles and all of his work there and uh, the desire for excellence. And for those of you who watched live stream all through the time when we were away, uh, you notice that a lot of things changed, hopefully for the better. Um, there were a lot of improvements made, a lot of lessons that we learned, and Pastor Coles is behind most, if not all, of that. And so I'm grateful for his hard work in something that people only think about when it messes up. And so uh, thank you, Pastor Coles. Again, uh, be sure to see him if you're interested in that. For those of you who are joining us by live stream, we'll stay connected for our morning service. Begin, or I'm, I'm sorry, that was our morning service. Um, for our Adult Bible Fellowship Hour beginning at 11 o'clock. Uh, we will have um, the, the Sunshine class be meeting in here. Pastor Coles will be teaching, and that's what you all on live stream will be able to enjoy this morning and be a part of. Uh, but also our family class that's been meeting last week, met in the chapel. You will be in here in the auditorium uh, as well this morning. And so I um, want to encourage you that way. We'll still have our men's and ladies classes, the friendship class, uh, we'll all be meeting, and the teens will be meeting as well. 
I do want to share a few uh, anniversaries this week, and congratulations to these couples, Bill and Connie Davenport, celebrating 52 years today. So congratulations to you. Uh, Pastor Ned and Deetra Davis celebrating 45 years today. And Mike and Wanda Woodyard celebrating 45 years today as well. Uh, so make sure you pass along your congratulations to those folks. And then Pastor John and Cindy Radice celebrating 22 years of marriage on the 25th. So uh, we want to congratulate each of those couples. I look at these numbers and the fact that my wife and I just passed five years you know, I thought that was a big milestone, but <laughs> congratulations to each of you. Uh, the children's Sunday school class for the two through five year old, uh, two through five year olds, this went out by email this week, will not be meeting once again this week. Uh, Lord willing, they'll be able to meet again soon, uh, but for today, they'll not be meeting. And the, the first through sixth graders will be combined over in the fellowship hall, that first bay as you enter the double doors into the fellowship hall. Uh, all the children first through sixth grade will be combined in that area and grateful to the faithful Sunday school workers there. There is a Sunday school video for the children up on the website and our Facebook page. For those of you who are not able to be a part of the Sunday school hour, I encourage you to watch that and uh, parents watch that with your children and uh, be able to, to speak with them, interact with them about the lessons there. Uh, we were planning to begin Wednesday night children's program this coming Wednesday, the 22nd. We're going to postpone that one week till the 29th. Um, just several things uh, coming together there that I believe it's best for us to postpone that beginning until uh, July 29th. But we'll plan on beginning Patch Club then. And then uh, I, I want to thank each of you, commend each of you um, this morning. Uh, I notice that you're taking pastor's instruction and encouragement uh, seriously. Uh, many of you wearing masks this morning and trying to be careful about distancing. Um, as pastor mentioned on Wednesday, and there was an email that went out, we want to continue to be vigilant. And uh, if you've let things slack off, I'd encourage you to, to be vigilant now. Um, we want to wear masks. I know for some folks there are health issues concern involved that keep you from wearing a mask. but. Um, if you're able to do that, I encourage you to do it. Um, whatever the reasons might be that you wouldn't want to, um, it's for the sake of a couple of things. Uh, first of all, our testimony as a church, um, and then also to protect the health of one another. Um, even if there are questions about how effective that is, if we can do something that might help our brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, we ought to do it. And Romans 14 reminds us that we ought to be willing to give up our liberty for the sake, for the good of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I want to continue to encourage you to do that. For those of you, if you aren't wearing a mask, I just encourage you to be extra vigilant about keeping your distance. Um, we want to continue to be able to meet together this way, and we want to keep um, our church family from being somewhere that the virus is spreading. And so I appreciate your attention to that. Uh, the ushers will be at the doors with offering plates for you to, to drop off your offering this morning. We'll have a word of prayer and you'll be dismissed. If you would stand with me together as we pray. Our Father, I thank you for this morning we've had together. So many wonderful reminders today in song uh, and from your word. And even as we are burdened for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are going through uh, some difficult, very difficult times right now. Um, you've helped us be reminded over and over again about your control and your love. And I thank you that we can go uh, from here with that assurance today. I pray for your blessings on the Sunday school hour, on the adult Bible fellowship time. Uh, would you fill each of the teachers, help them as they share your word, to share it faithfully, and help us all to listen eagerly, ready to receive what you have for us. We love you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Yes, sir. Do what? Don't yell. Oh. <clears throat> okay. Uh, it, it was mentioned earlier uh, by uh, Pastor Brown. Be, uh, be in prayer for Bill and Diane. Both of them in bad shape. Uh, Janice called me last night, and then she called me again at almost 12 o'clock midnight. And I woke up. I said, I thought I heard the phone ring. Now I heard it ring. Kept kept ringing. So I jumped up and answered the phone. <clears throat> and uh, Bill actually coded. I understood he coded in ambulance. But uh, so, but anyway, they got him back. And he's in intensive. I, she, I talked to her again this morning. I called to see if anything changed. But they did bring him back. And he's in uh, ICU. Uh, and then Diane would, was in the emergency room. They'd come back and got her. Because uh, she couldn't walk, and uh, she was admitted this morning. But she had been two or three times, and uh, they said, that, in fact, the doctor told Cheryl when Cheryl called him because she couldn't walk, and that uh, says, well, she was just here a week ago. We, we can't, ain't nothing wrong with her. <laughs> so, but the ambulance come back and got her after they took Bill, and uh, so she has been admitted. She can't, she can't walk. I don't, they're going to run a bunch of tests. Remember Bill and Connie? Again, this is their 52nd anniversary. Give them a call or whatever. Uh, I got them early this morning. I had, I got a, got one of those birthday sheets uh, from, well, you know, Sandy's been out, so I didn't get it from her. But it uh, <laughs> had a lot of errors in it. I called Bill two days for his birthday. Marty's was one day and Linda's was another, and, but I, they were backwards. But it, uh so uh, I missed, uh, I saw, saw Linda, but it, uh, so I heard she done had hers uh, when I thought it was going to be Monday. Uh, <clears throat> any other prayer requests while I'm up here? I think I can see you. Yes, no, nobody got a prayer request? Uh, yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, amen to that. There is a lot that I had to go to the doctor Friday, not for COVID, but just for a regular checkup. And he mentioned that he thought we needed to go back to phase one. He says he thinks the second wave is going to be worse than the first one. And I'm not trying to discourage you or anything, but just be careful. As you heard this past weekend, we didn't have anybody with it in our church all these months. And now all of a sudden we got, uh, what, one, two, three, about four people. And that, uh, and others that have been exposed that have been quarantined. So that's why you see a lot of people missing. Uh, but it, uh, so pray for, uh, for everybody's safety, more or less. <clears throat> okay. Uh, any other prayer requests? Y'all scattered all around. Preacher, you don't have to preach. But <clears throat> this thing will help you, I'm sure. Uh, the only thing we've got coming, you know, we've had to cancel everything so far. We are going to have the planning session for the simple reason I need to get it on the calendar. 
uh, the planning session is August the 11th, I believe. It's at, uh, <laughs> at I don't have a calendar up here with me. I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's a Tuesday. But anyway, it's uh, uh, August 11th. We have, what's the best pizza? <laughs> Free pizza. So we're going to have pizza and sodas and what have you. And we will space you out a little bit so that uh, we won't be on top of each other. But come with some ideas of what you want to do next year and hopefully what we've got left of this year um, from about September on. But uh, anyway, we, we need to get that done so that they can get it in the calendar when they have the meeting. Okay, let's go to prayer right quick. <clears throat> Lord, we do thank you for the opportunity to be in your house this morning, Lord. We do ask that you continue to watch over us and protect us. Lord, I ask that you be with Brother Bill. Uh, I'm sorry that he's having so much uh, physical issues. I pray he's failed several times. And uh, yesterday he coded. And I uh, pray, Lord, that uh, that you uh, be with him, be with the doctors, give him wisdom as how to minister to him, as well as his wife, Diane, Lord. Uh, be with her health. Lord, and be with Janice. She was mighty stressed out when she called last night. And so uh, be with her as well. Lord, we thank you for... Uh, Bill and Connie, 52 years. Hope, Lord, that they have a real nice day today. <clears throat> Lord, be with Pastor Coles as he brings us the words that you'd have us to hear today. Help us to be tentative. Shut out the things of the world, Lord, that we can listen and apply it to our lives and walk closer with thee. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Bob. I didn't hear a word of that, but it probably wasn't important anyway, so. <laughs> Just kidding, Bob. <laughs> next Sunday, uh, my wife and I will not be here next Sunday. I, I'll have the, I have the privilege of preaching next Sunday at Clover Hill Baptist Church up in Richmond on both both services. So, uh, Brother Long is aware of that, and he's making arrangements. He may be, he may be our teacher next Sunday morning. I'm not sure, but uh, anyway, he's taking care of that. So. I uh, just wanted you to be aware of that. Uh, <clears throat> I want to talk to our those who are watching by live stream. Make sure I'm on camera six. If you want to talk directly to people at home on live stream. Um, our lesson today is very sensitive. And uh, it has to do with sexuality. And I'm going to be saying some things that if there are some children... Uh, if you have some children at home, it may be good for you to divert their attention someplace else during this lesson today because I'm going to say some things that uh, that eventually they'll need to know and uh, some things that as parents uh, you should teach them at least eventually when time comes for that but I just want to give you that heads up if uh, um, if it's uh, necessary for you to turn live stream off we understand that I hope not but but anyway um, uh, just a heads up on that I'm I'm teaching this morning a lesson entitled The Wisdom of Purity. Very, very important lesson, and it's something that all of us uh, need to learn. I said that, uh, that uh, I'll be saying some things today about our marital relationship, physical relationship in our marriage, and, uh, which is a very important thing. I, I, wish I, had, I wish I had the whole church, or at least all the adults, to teach this to. And, I think some of the other classes may be teaching this same lesson, I'm not sure. But uh, <clears throat> what I have to say, to say today is extremely important. And I hope you'll listen with both ears and um, take the advice of the scripture and um, put into practice in your own personal life some of the things that we can learn from the word of God today. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we pray that you'll guide our thoughts this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of teaching and preaching your precious word. 
We're grateful, Lord, for the instructions of your word. We're thankful, God, that, that you are very explicit in, in your instructions about the purity of life. We're grateful, Lord, of the, what comes from, the, from uh, Proverbs, which we'll be looking at today in this regard, as Solomon talks to his son and teaches him and trains him and, and shares with him some extremely important principles for life especially in this area of purity, proper sexual relationship, and so on. And so we commit this lesson to you. Thank you, Lord, for our class. Bless our hearts together, we ask in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. When I got the news this morning about uh, Bill and Diane White, my heart was greatly grieved uh, about that, and I, I immediately went to prayer for both of them, and I hope that you will be much in prayer too for Bill and Diane, especially Bill. Bill uh, is, in, uh, is in critical condition, I understand. Pastor Asher also text, text me and some others, uh, some of the other staff members, and said that he was in critical condition. So uh, we really need to make sure we take him before the Lord. A lot of what I'm gonna say this morning <clears throat> probably applies, we're all adults here, okay? Uh, and it applies to all of us, but truth is that um, some of our younger people, younger couples, might benefit a little bit more from some of the things I say today, but the truth is that all of us can learn something that we need to know. Now, let's just be honest with ourselves today. All of us have had thoughts cross our minds that are impure. The devil sees to that. Um, he doesn't like us, he doesn't like God's children uh, thinking pure thoughts. But it all begins in our mind, folks. It all begins with our mind. And I'll say a little bit more about that later on. And it's very important for us. It's a wise thing, as the title of our lesson is, The Wisdom of Purity, to maintain a pure life, to keep ourselves clean before God, and, and for for our spouses and for, for each other, for our own sake, but more than anything, for Christ's sake, to keep ourselves pure. I have a subtitle here that says, Sex, Sexual Purity is the Way of Blessing While Immorality is the Way of Destruction. And it certainly is. Open your Bibles to Proverbs. We're gonna look at several passages of scripture, but primarily, verses of scripture found in Proverbs chapters five through seven. And I'm gonna ask you to kind of turn back and forth and uh, some of those uh, verses in those chapters. Uh, we, we of course won't have time to read all of those chapters, all those three chapters and other areas of scripture that we'll be looking at, but, uh, but we'll be looking at specific verses in these three chapters and I trust that it will be a real blessing to your heart. We're gonna begin in chapter six, Proverbs chapter six, and I'd like to read for you verses 23 and 24. Proverbs chapter six, verses 23 and 24. Here's what, here's what Solomon wrote. I want you to keep in mind as we study this lesson that Solomon is talking to his son. In fact, if you look at the first two words in chapter five, he says, my son, and so what he's doing is he's giving, he's giving advice. He's giving, I don't want to say a lecture, but perhaps we could say that. But he's, he's, he's giving his heart to his son. He's saying this, he says, son, there's some things that you need to know about life. And uh, there's no better teacher than me. I can help you with these things. And so he gives him some very pointed advice and uh, and in these chapters the advice that he gives his son has to do with morality with sexuality with keeping himself pure with avoiding the pitfalls of life that so many people that we know probably every one of us in this sanctuary today know of somebody that's fallen into moral sin 
and uh, some people that we that we thought better of uh, some people that we thought would never be impacted by uh, such uh, such sin and we were surprised when we heard about it and and uh, and grieved when we heard about it maybe even in our own family and uh, but I want to tell you that nobody none of us is exempt from this none of us we all have like passions and we still follow we still fight with the flesh every day and uh, uh, and and it's a battle the devil doesn't like us living pure lives the devil doesn't like it when when we try to glorify God in our bodies as we're supposed to do he doesn't like that and he'll do everything he can in his power to get us to go astray I don't know uh, I don't know if there's ever been a time in history maybe there has been I don't know way back I don't I don't know I wonder I understand that during the Roman Empire that things were very very immoral and just debauched um, but we're we're approaching that or we have we have come to that in this day uh, you can hardly turn on the TV without being uh, inundated with some kind of sexual content and uh, perversion in fact we've even got to the point in our social life today where we've ex accepted it it's become accepted practice homosexuality and and as all these other perverted types of sexuality they've become accepted practice in our society today and the truth is that it's even impacted some Christians lives uh, I've known some Christians, some people who claim to be Christians that were homosexuals. Oh, well, I've got some news for them. Um, and uh, my heart goes out to them. And, and uh, uh, they've been deceived by the great deceiver, Satan. But here's what Solomon says to his son in chapter 6, verses 23 and 24. He says, for the commandment, he's talking here about the word of God. He says, the commandment is a lamp, and the law, again, a reference to the word, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. He's giving his son instructions here. And he said, son, as I, as I share this with you, I know it's, it's a reproof, but it's a way of life. And then he goes on this, and he says, this is the way of life, to keep thee from the evil woman and from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. When you read that term, strange woman, in the book of Proverbs, he's talking about a harlot, um, a prostitute, perhaps, but an immoral woman and uh, who's ready to, to deceive you and destroy you. Sexual freedom, freedom has thrusted a great cost upon our society today. Increased immorality has led to increased occasions of sexual trans transmitted diseases. Sexual freedom has also led to other social problems like abortion, homosexuality, pornography, cohabitation. Cohabitation has become an accepted thing in our daytime. It's not unheard of for people uh, for a man and a woman to live together now that, without being married. It's acceptable. Not by me, not, not generally by Christians, uh, by the church, but by society itself. It's an accepted thing. And if we as Christians express our, our beliefs of what is based upon the word of God, we become castigated for that. And considered square pegs in a round hole and and uh, uh, antediluvian type mindset, you know, <laughs> and that's the view that the world that the world view has of us is that we're just weird because we wouldn't accept that and and uh, approve of that. Well, what would you say to someone who thinks the Bible's view of of uh, immorality are outdated? Let me ask you another question. 
will the Bible's promotion of purity ever be outdated? Well, I think we all know the answer to that question. Of course, it's not. God's message on purity has not changed, and it never will. And the need for God's message on this subject has, has never changed either. We need to preach it. We need to teach it. We need to understand what the Bible has to say. Stop listening to the world. Stop being uh, impacted and impressed with the world's standards. And let's get back to the Word of God and see what God has to say about that. Solomon's instructions about sexual purity is a worthy consideration. God hasn't changed his mind about sexual purity, uh, even for those who live in a, sexual, in a sexually saturated culture. As I mentioned, Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 1, Solomon said this, Son, my son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow, thy, and bow thine ear to my understanding. I've got something to tell you, son. Listen to me. It'll save you some heartaches if you listen to me. It's what Solomon's saying. Now, we realize that Solomon later in his life compromised his life as well. We're sorry for that. Uh, he succumbed to, uh, to, to women, actually. It was one of the things he came and succumbed to. But at least at this point in his life, he was right even to the point where God left the wisdom that he left us, that he, that he wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for us today to be attentive to. And that's kind of a strange thing, and yet God works that way. So you have your hand out there. Roman numeral number one is the rewards of purity. The rewards of purity. Some Christians have viewed sexuality as a, as a repulsive, shameful, shameful experience to be endured within the prison of marriage. But this perspective is not biblical. It's not, it's not biblical. God, God is the author of our sexuality. God gave us that natural drive that we have as human beings for purpose, a good purpose. It's us who have, have uh, abused it and um, um, wronged it, not God. God gave it for a very specific reason, and we're going to delve into that in just a few moments here. So letter A, what are God's intentions for intimacy within a marriage? What's his intentions? Proverbs 5 and verse 18 says, Let thy fountain be blessed. And rejoice with the wife of your youth. I don't know if you, you, you've read that verse several times and you've just kind of skipped over probably and not really had the real depth of meaning of it. Let me just share something with you. When he says, let thy fountain be blessed, he's talking about the fountain of our spirituality. That's what he's talking about. We're just going to be up front with it today, okay? He's talking about our, our sexual relationship in a right context. And then he says, rejoice with the wife of thy, of thy youth. What's he saying? He says, have fun with your wife. That's what he's saying. The wife of your youth. God highly regards sex within marriage from the very beginning of creation. Here's what he said. In Genesis chapter 2, uh, verses 24 and 25, he said, a man shall leave his father and his mother shall cleave unto his wife, and they, t they shall be one flesh. You know what that's talking about. It's talking about sexual relationship. They shall be one flesh. Uh, and they were both naked, the man and the wife, and were not ashamed. God blessed Adam and Eve's union and clearly stated that it was not a shameful thing to engage in a sexual relationship. Well, <clears throat> what about the New Testament? Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 and 5, Jesus reaffirmed that original intention in marriage. This is what Jesus said. He which made them at the beginning made, made them male and female. There's a reason why God 
united, a male and a female. Not a male, not, it's not Adam and Steve, it's Adam and Eve, you see. And anything different than that is a perversion of God's intention. Uh, made them at the beginning, male and female, and he said, for this cause, because you're a man and a woman, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. There comes a time when it's time to leave home. Start a new family. Start a new priesthood. And, uh, and then cleave to your wife, he says, and they twain shall be one flesh. You see, the Bible relates to the sexual relationship between a husband and wife as a one flesh relationship. We had Dr. Walter Fremont in our church a number of years ago when I was pastoring in Hopewell for a family, uh, for a marriage counseling, a marriage uh, seminar, uh, you know, one of those weekend things. We've had them here. And he kept referring to the relationship between husband and wife as a one flesh relationship because that's the biblical term. It's what's called one flesh. And, uh, and what the scripture means about the one flesh relationship is the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. All right, so that's what God's intentions in marriage were. Well, what about the Apostle Paul? What are the Apostle, this is the letter B, what are the Apostle Paul's intentions for intimacy within a marriage? Isn't it interesting that Paul says the same thing? God said it first in the Old Testament. Genesis and in other places Jesus confirmed it and here comes the Apostle Paul which we heard a lot about today that was an excellent message wasn't it in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 31 and 32 Paul wrote for this cause for this reason man shall leave father and mother shall be joined unto his wife and they shall be one flesh this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And so Paul takes the marital relationship and, 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 um, and uses it as an illustration of the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Now that relationship is not the same one flesh relationship, so to speak, as, as it is between a husband and a wife, but he's talking about intimacy here. That our relationship, the relationship of the church to Jesus Christ should be a very intimate relationship. That's the reason why we should give our whole heart and mind to Jesus Christ and allow him to control us and use us for his glory. All right, so what are we to conclude, conclude then about, uh, about sex based on God's words to Adam and Eve, Jesus' words to the Pharisees, and Paul's comparison of the bride of the bride to the church. God endorses it. God endorses it. And let me just be let me just be very frank. Every time a husband and wife have that relationship, God puts his approval on it. He endorses it. That's a good relationship. Let me use this illustration. I uh I led a lady to the Lord uh, that started coming to our church when I was pastoring in Hopewell. And her husband wasn't saved, and she went home and told her husband that she got saved. And his first comment to her was, well, I guess that's the end of our sex life. Well, he soon found out, I think, that it was probably the beginning of it, really. And... Uh, but that's, but that's the attitude that, that that's, what, that's how the world looks at it. You know, can't have any fun anymore. You know, that's the end of it all. No, it's not. It's a wonderful, beautiful relationship that God illustrated by his relationship to the church. And it's a, it's a, it's a relationship that, that married people should, should readily enjoy. So that brings us to point number two, the price of immorality. The price of immorality. In Proverbs chapter 5, Solomon 
has a conversation with his son, as I referred to earlier, about sex and a pure life. And every father should have that same conversation with his sons. And I believe every mother ought to have that conversation with her daughters at some point in time. And uh, the truth is that a lot of fathers and mothers don't do that because they, it's a sensitive subject, isn't it? But we ought to have enough concern for, for our children that we'll, we'll find somehow, some, some way to set them aside, take them aside. And uh, we, t- we, we, talk, we say, tell them about the birds and the bees. It's not about the birds and the bees, folks. It's about a husband and wife. Uh, or tell them about the facts of life. Well, <laughs> um, no, tell them about the one flesh relationship and what God thinks of it and, 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 God's, uh, and God's, um, uh, God's intentions for it and his plan for it and the beauty of such a wonderful relationship. We get the idea that this marital relationship is, is um, I'm groping for words here, um, but you can fill in the words, okay? But we get the idea that it's an impure something or other, you know. And, uh, no, it's something that God designed. And, and for two reasons. He designed it, first of all, for the propagation of the human race. And also, he designed it for pleasure. And uh, we ought to thank God for it. Um, the answer, <clears throat> well, no, let me see. Why couldn't Solomon just tell his son about the benefits of marriage without going into detail about sexual sin? I think the answer to that question is pretty obvious. Uh, Solomon's son, sin, excuse me, Solomon's son, and all of us can be tempted to ignore God's wisdom and run our own lives if we want to. Uh, we lose sight of the devastating consequences of sin, and Solomon reminded his, sin, his son of those consequences so he would avoid the temptation to follow the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh is a very real thing. In verses 3 and 4, Proverbs 5, it says this, The lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth as smoother than oil. But her end is bitter, bitter as wormwood and sharp as a two-edged sword. Here's what Solomon was telling his son. He son said, son, you know about wormwood. It was a rather uh, prevalent thing at that time. Wormwood is a, is a bitter, poisonous hemlock. And a Ryrie in his study Bible, if you have a Ryrie study Bible, you'll find this note on that verse. It says this. It's a shrub with bitter taste, and thus the heights of bitterness. And he continues to say that the, adul- the adulteress may appear sweet, but in reality she's exceedingly bitter. And so he's warning his son about the temptations of those who may tempt him. And then he said, also says she's like a, shoot, uh, like a two-edged sword. Uh, this in actuality in the Hebrew is in the plural, and it points to the, to the inescapable nature of a sword's blow. It'll get you coming and going. And so it's a dangerous thing. When we flirt with sin, when we flirt with immorality, when we float, fir, uh, 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 flirt with uh, with. Uh, Promiscu- promiscuousness. Uh, we're going to get hurt. Eventually, we're going to get hurt. So, letter A under Roman numeral 2 sexual sin destroys the one who commits it. It's found in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 32. It says, Whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. Pretty straight uh, admonition to his son there, isn't it? In other words, sexual sin may seem to be fun and glamorous, but it leads to shame, degeneracy, and judgment. Letter B. Sexual sin is glamorized today. 
I mentioned this early when I was giving my <clears throat> opening remarks that uh, you can hardly do anything today without being inundated with some kind of sexual content. They even use it to sell cars and hamburgers and all kinds of stuff today, you know. As I said, you can hardly turn on the television without getting bombarded by some kind of sexuality and uh, a good reason to get rid of television. I don't know. At least control it. Amen. I have a question. What examples can you cite to show how sexual sin leads to bitterness and destruction? How many homes or families and lives can you point to as an example of what immorality and infidelity can do? You know, I was brought up in a generation when, uh, when I was a kid, you didn't even use the term pregnant in those days. It was, well, she's in a family way, or she's with child. And uh, all kinds of words have come to the surface here recently. I understand that Burger King now has put out a commercial using a terminology in it that none of us would ever use in the past. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that commercial on TV or not. Um, uh, that's not particularly referring to sexuality, but something different. But, but, but things have changed dra dra dramatically. Things have dr changed dramatically in the last years. Seriously changed. And, and we've gotten to the point where we accept things. Uh, the, the, uh, do I dare say this? No, I don't think I'm going to say it. But there are words today that were just taboo a few years ago that are commonly used these days. And, uh, and we hear them. And um, I'm fearful that, that uh, what we've heard may someday just uh, come out. You know, I, I, uh, I try to guard myself. I, I had a preacher one time tell me that he was preaching, he, he was preaching a message in a church on soul winning. And he was just really waxing out, and it seemed like the Lord was giving me real wisdom. And, and he, said, uh, he said, I came out with something that he said I would have never said. He said, there's some people that just don't give up about winning souls to Christ. He said, that's not my language. He said, but it just came out. And I'm afraid today that some of these words that we hear, not meaning to hear, we have to, in the workplace or out on the street or even on TV or something, we're, we're inundated with words that, uh, and all of that stuff, you know, gets in our mind. Well, anyway, while sexual sins have consequences, the consequences should not be our primary motive for purity. That may seem to contradict what I've been saying, but let me, let me explain. The consequences of sin are secondary to the fact that God calls immorality sin. And immorality offends God's holiness. And that ought to be the prim primary motivation for a believer to remain pure. Because we don't want to offend God. We don't want to be offensive to our Lord. Our love for God, our love for Jesus Christ, and not wanting to offend him should compel us to, to maintain a pure life, a clean life before God. Sexual impurity is a distortion of what God created to be beautiful, wholesome, and life-giving. And God's plan for sexual purity leads to life. In the seventh chapter of Proverbs, in verse 2 says, Keep my commandments and live. And my law as the, as the apple of thine eye. You know what Solomon saying there, son? God has written. Now, Solomon didn't have the whole word of God in his day. In fact, probably the most he had was the Pentateuch. First five, the first five books of the Bible. But he said, my, he said son, get your nose in the, in the word. 
and it's so important, keep my commandments. Keep God's commandments and live. And he says, make God's law the apple of your eye. Hide it in your heart. That's what the psalmist said. Thy word shall I hide in my heart that I might not what? Sin against who? Thee, Lord. He wasn't as much concerned about sinning against his fellow man as he was offending God. For he knew that if he was clean before God and if he didn't offend, if he didn't offend God, he wasn't, going to offend, he wasn't going to offend his fellow men either. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And, uh, and so Solomon was admonishing his son to keep the word of God. So... The price of, Im, uh, price of impurity is, uh, it destroys the person who commits it, and it does not glorify God. And that brings us to Roman numeral three, God's parameters for purity. God gave specific illustrations about a moral, moral purity in the Ten Commandments. He said, thou shalt not commit what? Say it. I didn't hear it. Did you say it? Adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14. But you know, there are other elements of that command that appear in other places of the Bible. For example, in Exodus and Leviticus, that are, that's an expansion of it. Um, immoral, immoral heterosexual relationships. Are wrong. All homosexual relationships are an abomination to God. All sexual contacts with ma contacts with male or female prostitutes strictly forbidden by the law of God. Strictly forbidden by God. And uh, we need to be aware of that. So God has set some parameters for morality. God commands. God commanded Israel to be morally purely morally pure because he wanted the nation to be distinct from other cultures that practice promiscuity. God intended that for Israel, his chosen people. He wanted them to glorify him, glorify him by keeping themselves sexually pure. And that's God's intention for us. That's, that's his parameter for us today. Letter A. God's command to be pure has not changed for New Testament believers. Is explicitly stated in the Old Testament for Israel and for Old Testament believers. But nothing's changed. We may have changed dispensations from the old to the new, but the truth is God's moral standard still has not changed. His command has not changed. It's for believers today. Number one, believers today are to use their bodies to glorify God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. What? Paul said. Know ye not that your bodies, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Now let's just park there for a minute. My body, because I'm a believer. Your body, because you are a believer, you're a child of God, is indwelt by the Spirit of God. It's the temple of the Holy God, of the Holy Spirit. When you got saved, when you trusted Christ, when you called on God and you changed families from the devil's family to God's family, the Holy Spirit took up his abode in your body. You didn't feel it. You didn't see him, but he's there. I can't explain that, but the Bible tells it, so I believe it. Can I get an amen? Thank you. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God? God gave the Holy Ghost to you, and you're not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, what are the next words? Glorify God in your body and in your spirit. What's that mean, glorify God in your body and in your spirit? Uh, which are God's is the rest of the verse there. Well, you have to keep, 
your spirit, speaking of your mind. Glorify God with your body and with your mind. And I wrote this down. You have to keep your mind pure because your pure mind will keep your body pure. I alluded to that earlier on, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that later on. But keep that in mind. Garbage in. Garbage is what you're going to get out. Purity in. Purity out. You see, God, uh, God made computers long before uh, we had one. Uh, he made the first computer that lived in the Garden of Eden for a while. Uh, that's the brain of a man. In fact, the brain of a man is, uh, can outdo a computer any day. It's a whole lot better than an apple. Amen? Our brains are like computers. Whatever you put in, it stores it on the hard drive. Or whatever is there that stores it. And it doesn't go away. It's there. It's there. And uh, whatever we put into this apparatus that God gave us here between our two ears uh, sticks around for a long time. I'm told that whatever you put on your computer is not going to go away either. It's there. In fact, uh, the FBI has the type of uh, capability, technology, that they can go into your computer and take anything that you have deleted and find it. Same thing is true with our brain. That's far more sensitive than the hard drive on your computer. It's there. And it's not going to go away. So whatever you put into this device up here between your two ears is what you're going to get out of it. Do we understand that? And so, <clears throat> if you don't put pure things in your mind, pure things are not going to come out. And the Bible says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Well, and so we're to glorify God in our body and our spirit. God asks us to glorify him with our sexuality. But sin has distorted the original design. Most people no longer seek to glorify God with their sexual activity. Now, instead of God's glorification, sexual behavior is used for self-gratification. The sin nature has perverted and misused sexuality, so the problem extends beyond our actions to, uh, to infiltrate our attitudes and our lifestyle. And as a result, we get what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21 where he says the works of the flesh are manifested and then he lists them. The works of the flesh are manifested which are these. And the first few that he lists are what? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, and he goes on with idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, emulations, and so forth. But the first four that he lists here are impure sexual, sexual practices. Uh, these are the works of the flesh. And, uh, but, but notice what he says after he gives us that listing. And by the way, the listing he gives is not complete because he says, because he says this um, um, and, the li and the such like. In other words, he just gives us a partial list there. There, there are works of the flesh. But then he goes on and says this. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Really? Does that mean that an adulterer is not going to go to heaven? No. David, the Old Testament, was an adulterer, wasn't he? And I believe we'll see David in heaven. He got God's forgiveness for it poured his heart out to God and asked God to forgive him. But I think what Paul is driving at here when he says shall not be, shall not inherit the kingdom of God means that you're not going to get much of an inheritance of the blessings that come with going to the kingdom of God or being in the kingdom of God. 
I know there are different interpretations of that, but I think that comes the closest to what Paul's trying to tell us here is that, that we're going to lose some real serious blessings if we demonstrate, if we allow these, uh, if we allow these manifestations of the flesh to come out of our lives, if, if, that's, our, if, that, if that's our lifestyle. And by the way, I, I will say this, that if these things are the lifestyle of an individual, I doubt seriously if they are really saved. You know, we can't look, we can't look on a person's heart. We can only see the outside. God looks on the heart. But the truth is that a person who lives a fleshly, ungodly lifestyle uh, it seems to me can't be much of a child of God if at all. If at all and probably needs to get saved. So the believer today, believers today are to use their bodies to glorify God. Number two, believers today are to use their bodies to satisfy the normal desires of the marriage partner. God designed sex not only to glorify himself, but he also gave it as an act of giving oneself to their spouse. Married people should should choose to sacrifice in order to meet their partners or their, uh, rather their spouse's sexual needs. That's why he wrote Proverbs 5.18, Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. This verse, rejoice, or, uh, excuse me, this verse reflects the joy of a couple sacrificing themselves for personal pleasure uh, for each other. And Paul instructed the Corinthians in this regard in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 3, uh, verses 3 through 5. I'm running quickly out of time, but I think it would be good for us to take a look at those verses just real quick here. Let me read them, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. They're kind of self-explanatory anyway. But 1 Corinthians chapter 7, in verse, beginning at verse 3, it says this, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husbands, talking about their sexual relationship. Verse 4 says, The wife hath not the power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power over his body, but the wife. And then in verse 5 he says this, Defraud not one another. Defraud not one the other, except to be with content for a time that you may be, give yourself to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency, your inconsistency. And so, <clears throat> uh, that's another passage of Scripture that tells us that we are to give ourselves to our, to our spouse in this relationship. And by the way, this passage doesn't leave any room for selfishness, does it? Letter B, unfortunately... Letter A was God's command to be pure has not changed. Letter B, unfortunately, many today have abandoned God's proper plan for sexuality. Sin is no sin. Sin is so distorted has so distorted the marital relationship that getting or selfishness has become a higher priority than giving sacrifice. And uh, the uh, the absences of our the the obsessions of our culture have led us away from moral purity and have put a premium on personal pleasure. And that's spilled over into our marriage relationship. Today's moral culture has produced an atmosphere of indulgence rather than of responsibility. The arrogant statements uh, we hear today regarding personal promiscuity illustrates that pretty well. Here's some that we hear. For example, well, we practice safe, safe sex. Uh, that's equivalent to acting responsible. Really? I'm talking about people that engage uh, in sexual activity outside the bounds of marriage. Well, we, we do it safely, really. Um, or uh, avoiding an unwanted pregnancy supposedly fulfills our responsibility. But let me suggest something better. How about abstaining from promiscuous immorality, period. Then Roman numeral five, number five, 
Why do people yield to immorality or impurity? Why, why people yield to impurity? And I'm going to have to do this quickly because I've only got um, a few minutes left here. Why people yield to impurity? Letter A, a lack of devotion to God. Involvement in sexual immorality stems, uh, stems from a lack of devotion to God, in fact. This lack of devotion is the source of all sin. We find this out in Romans chapter 1. And in verses 21 and 28 of Romans chapter 1, it says this. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful, but, because, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do things which are not convenient, that is, things that are shameful and, and forbidden. And though God revealed himself in natural creation, the unsaved individual refuses to retain God in his thoughts. And so it's a lack of devotion to God. Now, I, probably what I've just said applies mostly to the unsaved, but the truth is that even for a believer that if we don't, if we don't practice what God has told us to do and, and keep ourselves pure, it, that too is a lack of devotion to God. Uh, letter B, they lack self-discipline. Solomon rehearsed the tragic, the tragic end of a, an undisciplined life. And I'm going to read uh, Proverbs chapter 5, verse 11. Go back to Proverbs chapter 5. Uh, beginning at verse 11. He says this, but, but now I have written unto you not to keep company with any man. I'm in the Rome. I'm in the, I'm in the Old Testament. I'm in 1 Corinthians. Let me go back to Proverbs. I knew something wasn't stacking up here, right? Proverbs chapter 5, beginning at verse 11. And thou mourn at the last. He's telling his son what's going to happen if he doesn't heed the word of God. When thy flesh and thy body are consumed. And say, how have I heard instruction in my heart despised re reproof? And have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, not inclined my ear to them uh, that instructed me. I've almost, I, I, I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and the assembly. And so this was, this was the result of Solomon's son if he didn't take heed to what God was telling him. He didn't take, take heed to the word of God. And so it's a lack of self-discipline. We have to discipline ourselves to do what God wants us to do. And that brings me to the last point, number Roman number five. How to cultivate purity. How do we cultivate a pure life? This is probably the most important part of the whole lesson. How do we cultivate a pure life? There are two things, I think, that will help us. First of all, cultivate a pure mind. We discover in both the Old and New Testaments that purity of mind is always the forerunner of a pure life. And Solomon begins in, verse ch uh, in, in chapter 5 with this admonition, My son, attend unto my wisdom. Bow thine ear to, to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that my lips may keep knowledge. Listen to me, boy. I've got something to say to you. He probably didn't use that tone of voice. But he's saying, son, listen. This is so important. Listen to me. Listen to me. Uh, 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 regard discretion. And, uh, keep, uh, and thy lips uh, keep knowledge. Uh, learn it all. That's the Old Testament. Garbage in, garbage out. Here's the New Testament. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28. Jesus said, You have heard that it has been said of the old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh unto a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already in his heart, in his heart, in his mind. Mental adultery. 
It's important to keep our mind right, folks. Uh, are your thoughts sometimes X-rated? A commitment to moral purity requires us to be willing to heed positive instructions and to avoid entertaining impure thoughts. Letter B. Commit to the will of God. I said there were two ways or three ways. Commit to the will of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 say this. This is the will of God. That's the way the verse begins. This is the will of God. Even your sanctification. You want to be pure? You want to be set apart? You want to be sanctified? Here's the will of God. That you should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Know how to control yourself. Commit your will to God. Commit to the will of God. And then three, uh, letter C, cherish the ownership of your body. You don't own your body. You say, well, it's cost me a lot of money. That's all right. You don't own it. God owns it. We read these verses a little while ago. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, beginning at verse 5, it says this. And I'm going to have to close with this. Beginning at verse... 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? Uh, for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. See what he's talking about there? But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without, uh, is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye, which ye have of God, and you're not your own? For you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body in your sp and in your spirit, which are God's. And so our bodies don't belong to us. They belong to God. He purchased them on Calvary. When he died on the cross, when Jesus died on the cross and gave himself for us, he purchased us. We are his possession. Paul used the term slave. I'm his doulos. I'm his slave. I do it do at his bid. I do what I do at his bidding. And that's where we are as Christians today. We, are, we belong to Christ. And so our bodies don't belong to us. They belong to him. So let's keep them pure for him. That when we stand before him at the Bema seat, he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. One final verse. I'm over time. I'm two minutes over time. All right, you'll be two minutes late to the restaurant. That's all right. I want to close with one verse. And I promise you I'm closing with this. In fact, when as soon as I read this verse... I'm going to pray and you can go, okay? You find it. It's found in the book of Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. It says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, God, for the instructions that we have. Thank you, God, for the privilege that we have to serve you. Thank you, Lord, for earning, uh, owning us and keeping us. And I pray, God, that you will help us to be faithful, pure-minded, pure-hearted, pure-serving servants for Jesus' sake. Amen.